Good morning. It is May 21st. I'm going to talk about memory today, but do we need to really know what the date is? No, because what I'm going to talk about would be relevant if it was June 21st or December 21st. I'm Maximilian Fuentes Fuhrman, a clinical psychologist, gerontologist. If you're watching this for the first time, thank you. If you're becoming one of our regulars and you're remembering that you watched this before, good for you. Today our topic is improving an aging memory. Our previous class was on, is your memory aging? And this is our fifth show. And so part of what we're going to talk about in improving memory is doing rehearsal and repetition. So we go back and remind you, if you're interested, if you haven't seen the other shows, the first show was, what the heck is aging? When does it start? The second show was, why does it happen? You know, we have no idea really why it happens. These are the theories of why it happens. Then we had a rerun of that show. We're going to have a rerun once a month. And then we had a show with Dr. James Houston on Chinese medicine, acupuncture, acupuncture, qigong, tai chi, and all these different Eastern slash alternative methods that you can use to help your health problems. I also want to mention, as I do on all shows, I'm not a physician, I'm a clinical psychologist with a PhD and a gerontologist. If you have medical questions or comments, we will try our best to refer you to geriatric doctors. These shows can also be seen on Facebook, as you might be streaming it right now at a later time, on iTunes, on Spotify, and also on YouTube and Instagram. I did that all from memory without even looking down. So today we're going to be actually testing your memory a little bit. So this will be sort of like an interactive program. Um, and again, I want you to really feel good that you're interested in this topic. On the way here, I'm listening to a interview with a woman that's writing about your 40s, being in your 40s, and how terrible it is to be in your 40s in the workplace. Because she was quoting Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Facebook, started Facebook, saying that younger people are just smarter, and how hard it is when you're in your 40s to feel like you can keep up. Oh my goodness, if a lot of you out there are way over your 40s, I mean, I'm going to be 60 on the next show we're going to be doing. I give you a little preview of that. Next week, uh, the day after Memorial Day, will be a rerun. And then on June 4th, the birthday that I share with Dr. Ruth Westheimer, a real Gemini birthday, we're going to be really having a lot of fun celebrating my 60th birthday. So when I'm hearing this again, even at 59, how terrible it is to be 40 and what happens to your memory, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you know, what an ageist sort of thing. And then the woman was saying, well, it's very hard to have any kind of legal protection, even though it's there, because it is so much part of the culture that people just feel that you're, quote, not as smart as you get older. And people internalize that. And over and over, my basic theme in this show is to empower yourself. Every single week that you watch this show, you are a week older, as is everybody else on this planet. There is no way to stop it. So we're going to talk about ways to manage it. And certainly with regard to your memory today, what can you do to enhance it? A lot of when people will say, I'm not as smart as I used to be, what they're actually meaning is I'm not as quick. I can't like think on my feet the way that I once did. I can't come up with new information. I can't remember the date. I can't remember my friend's names, all these sort of things. So today I'm going to see just for each of you how good you are with what's called new learning and immediate memory, which is, again, when people are just talking, it's like, what am I supposed to be talking about? I can't, I can't come up with it anymore. When I was young, it always just came to me. And then you think, well, your head was kind of empty. That's why things came to you. So I'm going to show you right now our first set of slides with two pictures. You should be seeing two pictures. And on one side is a doggy, and on the other side is a kitty. And I was telling my doggy this morning, he's going to be famous because here he is in Hollywood. And so the doggy is actually a breed called a Siberian Husky. 
and his name is Diesel, as the gasoline diesel. He was actually named after Shaquille O'Neal, the basketball player whose nickname apparently is Diesel. And on the other side is a kitty who is a Turkish van kitty, that's the breed. And he's red and white, he has this huge big tail, and he's inside of a tent. And the reason I'm giving you all this context is a lot of times when you try to remember something, the more context that you have, the easier it is. And the last thing I didn't tell you about the kitty is that his name is Rocket. And he was named that because he's red and he used to fly around on my house. These were my pets. My kitty passed away about a year ago and we have steps in the house and he would run up and down the steps. So just to review, we have the doggy named Diesel and we have the kitty named Rocket, if you want to remember that. Because again, like so many things, it's like it's relevant to what the heck that you want to remember. If you don't care about animals, or you don't care about the names of animals, then this is not going to be a very good test of your memory because maybe you don't care about things like that. We also, just to review, we have the doggy is on the left side of the slide and the kitty is on the right hand of the slide. And this is directional memory, visual spatial memory, which can be very important in you trying to remember kind of where you parked your car. If you go to the restroom, like in a restaurant, like which way do you turn when you come out? My clients will say, oh, I'm just so stupid. I went to the restroom and I couldn't find like where my table was, where my friends were, and they're waiting and waiting and I had to ask for help. As you get older, it's okay to ask for help. When you start off life, you ask for a lot of help. I see this in little kids all the time and then people say, oh, I don't want to ask for help when I'm older. You're gonna age a whole lot better if you're willing to ask what I consider kind, young, giving people to say, you know, where, where was the table in the front of the room or where is the restroom? And they'll direct you, they'll take you by the hand and help you. So I'm also gonna be showing you some videos today to remind you as we have in previous videos that in really elderly people, people that could almost be my grandparents, that they are still capable of learning new things, putting new things into their memory. So again, if your memory was just like catastrophic, falling apart, then how will you explain that these people can do these things? Again, remembering a little bit in the previous show, we showed Virginia McLaren, who danced with President Obama and his wife at age 106, and then went on and was with the Harlem Globetrotters learning things about how to spin a basketball on her thumb. If you could not remember things, you couldn't learn new things when you get older, you wouldn't be able to see these kinds of things. So our first video today is a woman that, her name is Agnes Granny Zelnick. I'm sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly because I'm not comfortable pronouncing things often when I don't know the language. And all of you that are more than one language speakers celebrate that because that also is a lot of memory to be able to switch back from one language to another. It's amazing how people can do that. I'm not good with things like that. So we're going to see a short clip about this woman that is known as the oldest, quote, functioning, like teaching person in the United States. We're gonna see a few seconds of Agnes, Mrs. Agnes, I wanna call her Zelensic. Okay. A New Jersey teacher is hitting a major milestone today, her 102nd birthday. Isn't that a big number? That's a really big number. Your doctor said you're in good health? Yes, he did. He says my heart's like a 40 year old. <laughs> Agnes Zelnick is believed to be the oldest working teacher in America, and she has no plans to retire. Granny is a beam of light, this gentle strength and warmth that emanates from her at all times, and we have this incredible opportunity to be in her presence and to be able to learn from her. Affectionately known by her... So amazing, and very much what you were seeing about Virginia McLaren last week she's interacting with children so this too is so much part of memory if you are around younger people all of you that are living in an age surrogated housing place 
retirement community, even assisted living. Important that you're around younger people, particularly children. Children are very in the moment. Children very much warm to older people having time to spend with them. They have a very good sense of humor, of being in the moment. A lot of you where you might be upset sometimes that your children don't come and visit you as often as you'd like, or they're really not that interested in what's going on with you, or you can't really get their attention, they're distracted, they're on their cell phone, they're taking care of their children, all these things. When you spend time with very little kids, like your grandkids, and even these other children that this woman is teaching, that really helps your brain, we're finding, to stay young, to stay current, to stay in the moment. So now we're gonna go on to a slide that talks about what really happens with your memory and what are some of the things that can contribute to it in bad ways, the abnormal things that can happen with your memory. So I'm also gonna get you to see now if you can remember, and this is gonna be challenging for my engineer today, but she's young, she can handle it. I showed you a picture in the very beginning, so that was about 10 minutes ago. So this is encoding this into your memory of two beings. Do you remember what they were? One was on the left side, one was on the right side. And so in this first picture, and we don't need to show the picture yet, I'll tell you when to show the picture, we had a being, and that being's name was, was it Dirk, was it Snowy, or was it Diesel? So you can write down your answer. And on the other side was another being, and that being's name was Ruby, or Rocket, or Randy. So write down your answer. And now I'm gonna ask my engineer to show you the picture one more time, which does not have their names on it, for you to get a good look at these beings. So one is a doggy and one is a kitty. And they gave you a lot of context that one is a Siberian Husky and one is a Turkish van. And that may be important to remember later on, or it might not be. One of the other things that happens to your memory as you get older is you have a lot more trouble screening out kind of erroneous information or information that is not relevant to what it is you need to remember. Some of this is because you're out of practice. When we are in school, even as adults in school, in night school, in college, in university settings, in graduate school, you get really good at studying for tests and kind of filtering out like what's salient, what's important to know from what's not. If it's been years and years since you did any of that kind of stuff, it becomes then difficult to know like what are the elements that I need to remember and so you kind of try to remember them all. And obviously the more things you're trying to remember, like if every day you put your keys in a different place, that's a much harder thing to remember than if every day you put it in the same place because then you just got to remember one thing. So now we're going to go back to our slide about the abnormal changes in memory. And abnormal just means that it's not normal. It doesn't happen unless you have a disease, unless you have some illness that's affecting your brain, unless you've had head injury, trauma, this kind of stuff. You've had a tumor in your head. It is not normal to have these changes. So I'm listing on this slide what puts you at risk to have these abnormal things. Half of the people, it says over 85, have some neurocognitive disorder, which is a fancy way of saying a dementia. I was talking to a client on the way over here this morning, and she said, I think my husband is dying of Alzheimer's disease and he's only been sick for like two months. And I said, oh, well, it doesn't move that quickly. It must be something else. And she says, well, that's what the family thinks. So a lot of what we're trying to get across in this program is you need to go to experts, geriatric doctors, geriatric psychologists, geriatric neuropsychologists, geriatric care managers, as you would with children, you take them to specialists, pediatricians, pediatric oncologists, like a cancer doctor, pediatric psychologists, because we again have very specific training and knowledge. 
if you don't really know what something is, you can end up then making a whole wrong diagnosis, a wrong treatment plan, and then you can even start frightening people thinking, oh, it's genetic, you know, Alzheimer's is a genetic, and so my children are gonna get it, or my grandchildren are gonna get it. Maybe that's not even what's going on with the person. So it says 50% of people over 85. 85 is kind of one of these benchmarks, like 16, 21. So half the people who are 85 are in really good shape, are able to do a lot of things independently, half of them not so much. And all of you know, out, out there aging as it were, that I know even at 59, some of my friends are not physically in very good shape. I'm on the other extreme. A lot of this is my genetics and my lifestyle and my good luck, whatever. So if you're one of these people that are not doing well, you didn't pick your, pick your ancestors as well as I did, that's a joke. These are the things that you need to be mindful of if you want to be. The physical inactivity, that keeps coming up over and over and over again. That so much what we used to think was part of aging is from disuse. D-I-S-U-S-E. Just not moving around. You could sit in the chair and raise your legs. That's moving around. You could just walk around your living room. That's moving around. You could get outside and do some gardening. You get outside and just do stretching. Getting outside is also very important for the brain. Walking around stairs in your house. This woman who is almost 100 now, Betty White, that many of you have heard about, they always ask her, does she do any exercise? And she kind of makes a face and says, no, I have a two-story house and a really bad memory. So she goes up and down the stairs. That's her physical activity. Fewer years of education. A lot of that, again, is just good luck, right? That you're in a place where you have access to education, you have the funds for education. Why is this a risk factor? Because a lot of it is then you believe that things are not treatable, they're not correctable, they're just part of aging, and it's not true. So I, I work with people that they're getting diabetes, and they think there's nothing you can do about diabetes because it's just part of getting older. Diabetes is an illness. It's not part of getting older. You can do things with diet, exercise, and taking medication to manage diabetes. Higher body mass index. This is a controversial thing about body mass, that should we even be using that with younger people? But the idea here is that if you tend towards obesity, this is not good in terms of your cognition, in terms of your memory. It makes sense, right? You're not getting as much circulation. The one thing, though, that is good, we're finding, I always think this is kind of interesting, if you tend towards obesity, if you fall down when you're older, you're far less likely to break anything. And some of our literature is showing us that in people over 90, it's good to be a little bit, quote, overweight. And what, again, what does that mean, overweight? Relative to what? All of you know that, again, it's your ancestors. You know, I'm a big whopping, like, five foot two. Well, I have four friends that are five foot two, and they all weigh more than I do, and they just have kind of like a bigger body, not in terms of obesity, just a bigger body, bigger hands, bigger arms. So they carry more weight more easily. That doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. We do know that if you tend towards being skinny, that this is also not good as you get older, not just in terms of falling down, but if you do have some kind of health problem and you end up losing weight because of that, and if you tend to be skinny, you probably don't have much of an appetite. That's just kind of how you are. That can be a real health risk. So what this just means is if you're tending towards being more overweight slash obese, that that's probably not good for you in terms of your memory as you get older, because in general, you don't move around as much. You know, it's amazing. People, I just have such compassion for them. Someone who weighs like 100 pounds more than I do, talk about exercise. For them to get up and move around, they're carrying an extra 100 pounds every day walking around. High blood pressure. Well, all of you know about that that's a risk factor for all different kinds of health things. If your blood pressure tends to be, geriatric doctors say, more than 145 over 85 on a regular basis, that you do need to have that managed. High blood pressure is a risk factor for, again, a whole lot of health conditions, but it kind of goes along with that you probably don't move around as much. So these all kind of are related in a lot of ways to what goes on to your brain. Cholesterol. 
A lot of you growing up, if you're an older person, you never heard of cholesterol. And even my younger students, they've heard of it, but they don't really know like what it means. Cholesterol is something that's in food, and some of you just make more of it than other people. I tend to make a lot of it, even though I'm a thin person. I can thank my ancestors for that. You also make more cholesterol when you're upset, when you're agitated, and when you're worried about your health and worried about your memory. That's so unfair, correct? Smoker, like smoking nicotine. A lot of you know that that's bad for you. It's bad for your lungs. A lot of things that go on if you tend to be a nicotine smoker can also be that you maybe don't eat as healthy. It blunts the taste of food. It also interferes with your circulation. So that's an issue we're looking at in terms of your brain. Presence of associated genes. That doesn't mean people named gene. That means the associated genes. So that if you've inherited a tendency for things like Alzheimer's disease, where we now have at least four genes associated with that, that's a risk factor. But just to emphasize, even if you didn't pick your ancestors well, it doesn't mean 100% that you're going to get something. The elevation, this is your scientific stuff, a beta amyloid and total tau, those are things that doctors can look for in your brain. And a long time we used to think, well, this is really indicating Alzheimer's disease, but now we really don't know what it is. But we're just saying that if you have a lot of those two substances, the amyloid is kind of like this sticky stuff, like plaque that you might get on your teeth. And tau are kind of like the lines of communication in the brain that are supposed to be like railroad tracks, and instead they're all commingled, kind of mixed up. And lastly, something that I spend a lot of time helping people with is major depressive disorder. That's a big risk factor in terms of you not wanting to do things, get out, you don't have any pleasure, your appetite is poor, you don't want to eat anything, you really want to eat comfort food, and then you isolate, you're not around people. We learn not only do you digest food better when you're in a social situation, but if you're in a social situation, it's so much better to keep your brain alert, energized, talking to people, taking you out of kind of your own issues, as it were. So now we're going to go back to our very first picture, because it's now been another 10 minutes. So we're going on like 20 minutes since I first showed you the pictures of these doggy and kitty. And just to have you write down, if you're interested in doing this, what do you remember about the doggy and kitty who are now here in the pictures? Can you tell me the breed of the dog? Can you tell me the name of the dog? Can you tell me the kitty? What kind of kitty is the kitty? And what is the kitty's name? And again, maybe you don't care about things like this. If you've had doggies and kitties, that can also make it harder. If you ever had a dog that looked like this, that can make it harder. I had told you in terms of the doggie's name that he was named after something that you put in your car to make it go, and also named after as the nickname of a basketball player. And I told you in terms of the kitty's name had a lot to do with how he used to run um, and also the coloring that he has on him. So let's see, just kind of checking in at the end, I'm going to give you the answers of how you're doing with that. So now we're going to show you another video. And again, the idea here is about learning that as we get older, we tend to think, even in a work setting, my goodness, in your 40s, it was saying, whoa, you know, I'm too old to work. This is what they were talking about on the radio this morning, that when you get to be older, how could you still be teaching? How could you still be learning things? Because that is memory. And you have to have such a good memory, kind of like my memory, that I can remember these things and I can come up with them like on demand. So this is the... Um, world's, it sounds like the circus here today, the world's this, the world's oldest yoga teacher. And one of the things that I most like about this particular person is that she got to do new things as she got older. You know, the stereotype often is, is you have to have been doing things for a really long time in order to be able to do them when you get older. This was not the case with this woman who likes to be called um, Tao. So she's only 96 um, in the, the clips that you're going to be showing, show, showing here. And I love to make mistakes because it tells you again that we're imperfect and we celebrate the imperfections. Some of you are aware that 
in cultures they'll make things like they'll make a blanket and they have an imperfection on purpose they'll make a bowl and they make it on purpose so you don't take yourself so seriously I think one of the things that I love about being older is when there are glitches when there are problems you say like nobody died from it we just kind of roll with it when you're younger you berate yourself and really get after yourself about things not working slowly and a lot of this technology that we're using here sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't a lot of you're old enough I would hope to be amazed like I am that we even have it at all so we're gonna show a few seconds here of the world's oldest yoga teacher I'm 96 years old and uh, I just dance and do yoga. Tao Porshon Lynch has been inspiring her students for. So amazing. The flexibility. When Dr. Houston, James Houston, was on the show a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about doing yoga, Qigong, Tai Chi, Eastern exercise. When you practice things like this, and again, this woman did not take up doing a lot of these things till she was older, you can really see the impact of use as opposed to disuse. All of you that find, oh, it's very hard to do this. It's hard to move my hands around as I've gotten older. Life is not fair. When you're young, you don't really have to practice that. As you get older, if you practice it, even like you're saying with this woman, you can do amazing things. But if you sit, become stiff, become rigid, you end up like the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz, where you say in the morning, wow, I'm so stiff, I can't hardly move around. That's a terrible feeling. You know, I'm getting older. I feel that in the morning too. So I try to do these things to help stretch and walk and move around. And usually for many people within a couple hours, they feel much better. The circulation to the joints really goes down while you're sleeping. And if you're in a place that is cold, it takes even longer for them to kind of wake up. Some of you are old enough to remember car engines that if you had parked the car outside, even in Southern California where it doesn't get that cold, you used to have to warm up the car for a good five minutes before you could really start up the car and kind of drive away. But the human body is the same way and the mind is that way as well. So comes on, you need like a few more little seconds sometimes to get going. You need a few more minutes sometimes to even remember things. This too is all of you that get frustrated with yourself because you cannot remember things on demand you cannot remember them quickly and then you'll say things like oh I'm so stupid oh I can't do this oh this is terrible the more that you say that to yourself the worse it becomes and you feel bad about yourself obviously you're not going to do well probably on much of anything so now we're going to go on I'm just going to show you some words that are actually part of a memory test a standardized memory test one of the things that psychologists are known for is doing testing, test construction, knowing a lot about what it actually means on how you do on a test versus how you don't do on a test. So we're going to be seeing three words. Our first word, our first slide, has to do with a round object that little kids might throw to each other, better known as ball. There's lots of different kinds of balls, right, like footballs, tennis balls, and I give you that context like a soccer ball because you can visualize that in your mind. So when you're trying to remember the name of something, we go back to how maybe you learned it when you were really small, which is visualization. If you just try to remember the word like ball, that's why it can be so hard to learn another language because how do you say ball in some other language? You're just remembering the word. If somebody shows you a picture and then they say, okay, well, here's a soccer ball. You imagine like a person kicking it. You imagine someone throwing it. Now you have a lot more connections literally in your brain to be able to find it, if that makes sense. And when you're trying to look up things on Google, it used to be like in a card catalog in the library to look up things. The more information you have, the easier it is to do that. So our first word, and I'm going to show it to you, is ball. So I have it up here, ball, right? 
And the next word I'm going to show you is something that has to do with people that maybe are patriotic, that they're going to wave that, like on 4th of July is coming up, Memorial Day is coming up, people might display that in honoring veterans um, outside their home. Some people drive around with flags actually on their cars. You can also have flags in other contexts, like in football they throw like a flag for a um, foul. People have flags often to designate like on the back of a truck that maybe they're hauling something that's sticking out so they can have like a red flag on there. Or often we'll talk about that's a problem. You know, I, I'm seeing red flags there that that's kind of bothering you that you notice something. So that's what that word is, is the word flag. And our last word is something that all of you nature folks like me, I spend as much time out of nature as I can, a uh, tree. Something that grows out of the ground and there's sort of like hundreds of different kinds of trees. Um, some of you could even imagine like drawing a tree, what might live in the tree. If you were a child, maybe you had a tree house. You could think of like squirrels go up in the trees when I'm walking my dog and they're often like chastising him and going after him, knowing that he can't go after them. Trees also bear fruit and nuts and things like that. And some trees in the winter, deciduous trees, lose their leaves. So there's all different kinds of images that you have of the trees themselves. The evergreens that don't lose their leaves, the ones that do, that change color. And you may have trees outside your window right now that you could look at. So here's our picture, our thing, our picture of the tree. Even though it's not a picture, it's the letters of it. And these, again, are just from language, so you don't have to mean anything. If English is your second or third language, you might actually translate these words into your primary language because that's in very, very long-term memory, and that can be easier than to help you. As we get older, you want all the help, I always say, that you can get to remember things. Younger people's brains don't have as many pieces of information in there. Ours do. I include myself in that. So now I'm going to review the words that I gave you were something that kids might throw or kick around, a ball, something that you might wave if you were really patriotic or you were a referee like throwing a flag to indicate a foul. And the last one is something that grows out of the ground, tree. So the words are ball, flag, and tree. You say that back to yourself. That's like registering the information. So if you want to remember something when you get older, a lot of what people don't do is register the information. If I'm introduced to you and I say, good morning, my name is Dr. Furman. You repeat it back. Good morning, Dr. Furman. You have now incorporated that into your brain. If you just hear me say that, and then you're kind of on to the next thing, it's really, really hard for you to remember that really, really hard. And I have this kind of unusual German name, so if you don't know German, that makes it even harder for you to think, well, how can I associate that with something? Well, once in a while, there's an association. Back 20 years ago, I guess it's been maybe more, and I forget these things as I get older, there was a fellow named Furman that was part of the O.J. Simpson trial, and he and I look nothing alike, he was uh, over six foot three or whatever, a detective, I think he was, named Mark Furman. So for a long time after that, people used to think my name was Mark without even realizing that they were taking his name because he was in the news and he was on television. And they remember my name started with an M, but they were making what's called a paraphasic error, something that kind of sounds like it, but it's not the right thing. And they didn't even realize that they were doing that. So when you're also in a situation where you have remembered something in a certain way and now you have to remember it in a different way, that becomes harder. The younger you are, the less you've ever had to remember in your life. So you don't have those erroneous kinds of connections. All of you that weren't alive during the O.J. Simpson trial never heard of Mark Furman, you're not going to think my name is Mark, but maybe some of the other people might. So now I'm going to show you um, a next, our next slide <coughs> Excuse me about what you can do to prevent these abnormal memory changes. We talked about what you could do in terms of risk factors, like what puts you at risk for those things, but what can you actually do? 
And it's not a very long list. This is also what we believe in 2019 that you can do. Some of this in 2029 or 2059, when I'll be 100, wow, that would be exciting, or 2100, imagine 2100. They might think that, well, this was kind of silly that we thought of these things. You know, they used to think that you could help people with leeches, and we used to prescribe actually um, nicotine smoking for your health to calm you down. But this is what we believe actually you can use now to help yourself. And before I get to that, I'm getting forgetful. I found this in a party store over the weekend. And I know you can't see this, but it says it's a pharmacy set. It's actually in French and Spanish. And it has anti-aging over the hill soap. It has gray be gone hair dye. It has WD oldie for lubricant for creaky joints. It says it gets out the creaks. And the last thing, instead of Tylenol, it says, tired and old, I see you aging. Mega strength, advanced pain relief for all, all of your aches, breaks, creaks, creaks, squeaks, moans, groans, and pains. And the pills themselves say old age. And on the outside, it says senior moments. This was in a party store. So this is something that you would give to somebody on their birthday. And they're going to say, well, thank you so much. And kind of like laughing about it. But it's amazing to me the depth of what I call ageism out there. As if everybody has these aches and pains and you laugh about it. And of course, you want to get rid of your gray hair. We know that. We know that. So before we go on to talk about preventing the abnormal memory changes, does anyone out there remember what the three words were? So it's been about five minutes since I gave you those words. So you circle back in your memory of what the heck were the words. And if any of you say like, I don't remember three words, that's probably not a good sign. But I doubt that that's probably the case. Or you might say, I don't want to remember words. This is not interesting. This is boring. I don't care. And that's a good sign. That means you have healthy self-esteem and you're not going to do just something because I ask you to do it. There was this famous quote one time that these big gerontology researchers at University of Chicago were testing problem-solving ability of older people. And this woman is there in the study and she's 80 years old and she says to them, Whose problems are we going to solve, yours or mine? And the researcher is going to take it aback, like, well, you're going to solve the problems we want you to solve. Well, maybe you don't want to. So if somebody actually does test your memory in the way that I've been testing your memory this morning, you don't do very well, it's possible that this is not the best way to test your memory or that you're not really interested in having it tested. That's as valid as anything. So our last slide here about what can you do. Movement. Always going back to the movement, movement, movement. Exercise helps fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence means learning new information as opposed to long-term intelligence like how do you do math problems? You know, How do you paint a picture? How do you ride a bicycle? That's more what's called like static, long-term kind of intelligence. You know, How would you help your grandchild tie their shoes? Fluid intelligence is what a lot of older people struggle with. How do you use the mouse? How do you use the laptop? You don't need to have anything in here for your fluid intelligence, right? It's soap and hair dye and all this. A lot of times the older people are just so much slower at learning new things. And they then associate that being slower than younger people as did the eminent Mark Zuckerberg thinking younger people are smarter. Younger people are just faster. That's all. And most of life is not a race. You know, if it takes you how many weeks to learn to use this laptop, so what? You're retired. You have the time. Even in middle age, middle age, the lack of physical exercise correlates with lower memory scores. So moving around, any kind of moving around, taking a dance class, playing hopscotch with your grandchildren, trying to chase your grandchildren around. Or I like to be like kind of like a referee for my grandson to say like, how fast can you do that? How fast can you pick this up? How fast can you kick a ball? Trying to get him to kind of get worn out, right? But I'm there in the middle like doing some of these things. Medications. Again, asking your medical doctor, maybe taking an antihypertensive, which is a blood pressure medicine. 
maybe taking an anti-inflammatory. So a study just yesterday came out saying that maybe taking a baby aspirin is not that helpful for you, but I always kind of cringe when I read that because as you get older, you get more like yourself and less like anybody else. So maybe it's good for you and maybe not for somebody else. And it says for gum disease, because if you have a lot of gum disease, if you tend to kind of be a person that you've inherited that tendency, that suggests that you have inflammation in your body and maybe taking something like a baby aspirin could help you. In the middle of that, it says what my friend who's a couch potato would like. It says, eat right and exercise, you're gonna die anyway. But it's, I guess, the quality of life, correct? And as more and more people live longer and longer, this is really their issue. A lot of people 100 years ago used to die in their 40s and 50s of heart attacks, strokes, and cancer. Nowadays, people have diabetes, arthritis, other autoimmune problems, they're cancer survivors, they're heart attack survivors, and their quality of life is not very good. And so what we're getting at here is ways then to enhance it, certainly by trying to wake your brain up. Your brain will heal better than any other part of the body. It's never too old to learn new information. All of you know that. That's why you're listening to me in part. The next section has to do with all the nutritional things that we believe in 2019 can be helpful for you. Some of you don't like fruits and vegetables, and maybe that's not a problem for you. But if you have been noticing that you're having these memory problems and you want to improve your memory, give these things a try. They're not for everybody, but it's the dark vegetables, the dark fruits, the dark berries, these kinds of things. And the omega-3, that is in salmon and mackerel, pecans, almonds, walnuts. Other things are the anti-inflammatory properties of turmeric, also known as curcumin, that is in cinnamon. When you travel to some countries, I'm told in the Middle East, and you buy like a package of band-aids, you actually find it has like turmeric or curcumin on it because it's a natural anti-inflammatory. And in India, where they eat a lot of curry, that actually has curcumin in it. And they don't tend to have as many forms of dementia in India, despite that they probably don't have as good a healthcare system in part as we do. Other things that are vitamin E and C and B12, and now kind of circling back that people are getting vitamin D from their doctors. This was very popular in the 60s that elderly people took Geritol. You may remember that on television, the ads for that. So like so many things where you say, we're eating organic. Well, most of you or your grandparents certainly ate organic because that's all there was to eat. Folic acid, coenzyme Q10, all these things important to ask your physician if it's okay for you to take these things in conjunction with other medicines that you might be taking. Social and mental involvement. That's what you're gonna see in this last video is being around other people having a purpose, having an identity, volunteering, doing something, getting out. If you have the doggy that I have from the first picture, boy, I get out and meet a whole lot of people just from walking him around. Loneliness and pessimism we're finding can increase your risk of memory problems. If you're a negative person, if you're loyal to your suffering, what a terrible way. I have such compassion for you to live that every day is another reason for you to look for negative things. And I realize a lot of you that maybe because you were traumatized when you were young, you've had other terrible events in your life. But this is, again, kind of promoting my profession. Psychotherapy, going to a counselor can really help you with that. And when you're older, you're actually able to learn things much faster because you want to change. You maybe don't have that long to live. And we may someday have vaccinations for Alzheimer's disease. So all of you that are out there worrying about your children, grandchildren getting Alzheimer's disease, maybe it's all just wasted worry. Mark Twain was known for saying, you know, that his biggest regret was worrying about things that never happened. So now we're gonna show our last little clip showing how this woman, the oldest yoga teacher, had transitioned from yoga to doing ballroom dancing. And that's exercise. So any of you that dance or want to learn how to dance, it's never too late to do this. Generations. And has been recognized as the world's oldest yoga teacher by the Guinness Book of World Records. And they kept all the way down to the floor. And right up, 
Nothing's impossible, whatever you want to do in life. Just tune in to know that within you is the answer to everything. And, and just don't think about it. Let anybody tell you, you know, that getting old. Energetic Tao was born at the end of the First World War in 1918 and has been a yoga instructor for the last 56 years. I've been like this since I was a child. There was so much to do. And if we spend our time just sitting there like this, it's not going to help at all. Incredibly, Tao manages to put people who are decades younger than her through their paces at her studio in Westchester, New York. I really wish when I reach her age, I would be as young as she is right now. I so what you're going to be seeing is the same person who's been a yoga teacher deciding she wanted to do something different. But she learned ballroom dancing in her 90s. And so it's never too late to learn to new, do something new. Dancing itself is exercise, enormous exercise. It really helps you with flexibility. So here we're going to see how she was able to do that. What an inspiration. I feel actually she's younger than me. She's very inspiring for me. She really had me to change my, my whole life. Tao also manages to inspire people a little closer to her age. I've, I've, as a retired nurse, I saw many people, 96, in bed, can, with a tube, a feeding tube, uh, unable to talk or walk. And she just is just the epitome. So I apologize if you weren't able to see that. We're going to work on it again, as I was even alluding to earlier. Life is imperfection. And as we get older, we laugh at our imperfections, hopefully, and we help younger adults to say, it's no big deal, nobody dies. Given the internet and how wonderful this technology is, you'll get to see it at some other point because it's out there. I remember when I was first teaching, well, I had to show things like on a projector and you didn't get like a second shot at it. So now we're going to do a little bit of review at the very end of our show here to see what you remember. Our very first slide was the pictures of the animals, and so some of you are able to see that with the doggy. And did you guess that his name is Diesel, as in the gasoline diesel, and Shaquille O'Neal's nickname. And the kitty, the red kitty in the tent, is named Rocket because he used to run up and down the steps like a red rocket. And then I had given you those three words. And you don't have to remember them in the order in which I gave them to you. That's not even part of any test. So if people ask you words, it's no big deal. You don't have to remember that that way. But the first one that I did show you and tell you about was ball. So that's something, again, that kids might throw to each other, kick to each other. The next one was something that people would wave if they were patriotic, or maybe on the back of a truck where it had like a big load that was sticking out, flag. And the last was for all the nature people out there, something that grows out of the ground and may lose its leaves or not, and that was tree. So if you did two out of three on that, and you're over 65, that's normal. If you got a three out of three, that's perfect. And if you got one out of three, maybe you don't care. Maybe you also didn't work in a field where words were that important. And again, if English is your second or third language, I couldn't do that in another language. So pat yourself on the back that you're even listening to this in English. We don't yet have a way to translate it. Maybe someday we will. This is just kind of the beginning of getting you to look at how people might test your memory and what you can do to help it. If you want to test yourself throughout the day, which is something, again, that you could do with other things in your life to impress people or yourself. You could remind yourself of what these words were in the context. You could draw a picture of them. Same thing with the animals and their names and the kind of animals that they were, the Siberian Husky dog and the Turkish Van Cat. If you want to remember things like that, you process it today. Every once in a while, you have those images in your head, and I must guarantee you that tomorrow, It'll then be in what we call short-term memory, and then you can remember it. If you really want to put in long-term memory, which I wouldn't recommend, because this is what happens when people go to school, and they remember all this information, and it's still there years later, kind of clogging up their brain, if it's not something that they want to know, 
If it's going to be in long-term memory, you need to practice this information for two whole weeks. If you find this daunting and kind of irritating, this is why your memory is not as good as you get older, because you don't practice and rehearse things. Younger people hate studying for tests, hate having to be tested even in work settings on things, go around and have like an improvement plan, or you actually working on the things that you were told you were supposed to work on, meeting deadlines, all this kind of stuff is all memory. And I talked about last week how all these smartphones have reminders, the computers have reminders. If younger people's memories were perfect, they wouldn't have reminders. But as you get older, you may not be challenging yourself. You may not be doing new things. If you watch shows like Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, those are really, really good, that they're challenging you, helping you to remember things. But we're learning so much in science about this that if you sit around, it's a risk factor for depression. You do the same thing every day. You take the same bus to go home. You drive the same way home. That's not a challenge for your brain. It's not a challenge for your body if you sit on the couch all the time. So essentially, what are you expecting? You are going to age, quote, more dramatically. Your memory is not going to be what it once was. And so I again ask you to something that I didn't say I was going to ask you to remember. Our next show is going to be a rerun about memory. And then the next show is going to be my big birthday show, and I'm going to be turning 60. So I'll be asking at the beginning of the show, how old actually am I? So that'll definitely be way into short-term memory if you remember that. But remembering this, that Albert Einstein had said, you know, I don't need to have a good memory. I need to just remember how to look things up. And now more than ever before, right, you can even ask Alexa. That's, you know, one of those like smart things that you talk to. I love to ask her questions like, how are you feeling today? Because she's a machine, she doesn't have any feeling. And she'll often say she doesn't understand the question. I say that's because you're a machine. Remember that what you have forgotten is probably more than younger people have already learned. And in this very youth-oriented culture, it saddens me to hear these things or see these products like this that are so demeaning and shaming. All of you, it's hard, right, to speak up. It's hard for you to give pushback and say, I feel offended, I feel hurt, I do know a lot of things, I can be of help to others, I have a lot of wisdom. It's hard for you to feel that you even have the right to say that. And so then you can kind of turn it on yourself, as I know a psychologist that you can do that, and feel nobody cares about me, nobody cares what I have to say, I have to hide kind of on my birthday, it's a terrible thing to have another birthday. In Okinawa, an island off the coast of Japan, they get to have like a sweet 16 party when they turn 86. It's like something to look forward to, something to celebrate, like maybe you did when you were 16 or when you were 21. I'm of a, the mind that imagine if you could celebrate getting older. It's not a disease. It's happening even as we're speaking. I thank you again so much for hanging in there through this whole show. I'm hoping that it's entertaining as well as educational. And again, honor yourselves that you're interested in the information and feeling better. Thank you so much.